Dungeons and Dragons has clerics and paladins that can heal your characters. But what about healing the players? Welcome to Gaining Advantage. Hi everyone, I'm Dale Critchley, the owner of Wormworks Publishing, and welcome to Gaining Advantage. Wormworks is all about helping you, the players, make other people's lives better. We're going to give you the opportunity as a company to be, for you to be the hero. We're going to be the forever dungeon master for you that is going to give you the resources and the training and whatever it is that you need so that you can use Dungeons and Dragons and other games like it to make other people's lives better. And so we hope that you will come and be a part of this journey and this adventure. The first step in that process is in the creation of a book that we're calling Disabilities and Depth, Creating Disabled and Neuroatypical Characters in Dungeons and Dragons. And what this book is all about is, it started out when I was looking to add some prosthetics like the combat wheelchair you probably heard of. And I wanted to add them into my Dungeons and Dragons game, but I thought, okay, well, Prosthetics are a solution to a non-existent problem if you don't have disabilities in your game. And so I started looking around for uh, how to do disabilities in Dungeons and Dragons, and I found that there really wasn't much there. And so I decided, well, then I'm going to write the book on it. So as I tried to figure out how to do this, I realized there's a lot of overlap between different disabilities, mental illnesses, uh, neurodivergence, and uh, where you have the same symptoms all over the place. And so I'm putting the, the book together using symptoms so that you can, with if you want, if you have a disability or a mental illness or, or anything like that, and you would like to create a character that's like you. And you have a list of different symptoms that you have because of your particular condition, then what you can do is you can look in this book and you can find those specific symptoms and put them together to create your character. Or if you'd like to randomly roll a character, you can do that. And in fact, when the book comes out, we will also have a random generator, a random disability generator that is based on the tables in the book. And that generator will be free on our website, wormworkspublishing.com. And so you can go there, you can roll up your character. It makes it easy for people that own the book. If you don't own the book, you can still use it. You just don't have the game mechanics, the, uh, the assisting devices, the magical devices and things like that uh, that go along with it, but you can still use it as is. And then we're also gonna publish a uh, disabled NPC of the week that you can use in your game so that just like the real world, you know, here in America, 25% of people and, and worldwide, the number that I found is 15% of people have some kind of disability. And so it makes sense that in your world where there's, you know, dragons going around chewing on people, that there's going to be some people with disabilities in, in your world too. And so we're going to create a disabled NPC of the week and make those available for free so that you can populate your world with them. And then what we'll do is those NPCs, a lot of them will have mixes of symptoms to uh, replicate real life people. And uh, so now with all that, some other things that I want you to know uh, about these projects is that uh, for the book, especially we are using all of our artists are disabled, neuroatypical, or mentally ill. And then we're also, because I really want to get representation right, and uh, while I have a, a handful of, of things that I deal with, I don't really consider myself disabled. I wanted to make sure that uh, we're representing those symptoms and disabilities correctly. And while we have about pushing 300 different symptoms uh, in the book, uh, I can't possibly find that many people that have every one of those because some of them are uh, 
extremely rare uh, and, and maybe that no one even alive right now has them in the world. Uh, some of them are isolated to very small areas in the world. Some of them are, some of them are magical and were created specifically for this book to think about what might disabilities look like in a magical world. And so there's no way that, that we can have representation of every one of those. But what I have done is make available, and I'm making this available to you who are watching this right now. I have reached out in various communities and connected with many people that have disabilities, that have mental illness and neurodivergence that have been willing to talk to me and share their experiences. And, and as I'm writing the book and writing up those symptoms for the book to use in the game, then I'm sharing those with them to get their feedback and see, is this what you experienced? Does this seem like a good representation of it? And uh, so I'm happy to do more of that. And so as the uh, before the book comes out, which would be later this fall, uh, anybody who wants to contact me and our contact information is in the show notes. And if you have disability, if you are neuroatypical, if you have mental illness and would like to, to share your experiences with me uh, in exchange for your time and your willingness to, to share something that's very personal, I'm willing to give you a free copy of the book. Now, also, we are looking for more artists, and uh, we have a bunch already, but we would love more because it's going to be a big book, and the more illustrations, the better. If you are an artist who is disabled, neuroatypical, or mentally ill, then and, and you are interested in providing art for the book, we will give you not only a free copy of the book when it comes out, uh, but we'll also give you access to the manuscript as it's being written. I'm writing it in a Google Doc, and so you can literally watch me type it. And uh, this is normally only available to our Young Dragon patrons, and but for artists that are willing to contribute, we are opening it up to you while the, this book is being written. And uh, so if you'd like to be a part of that, we also give you access to our Discord server, uh, which is also normally only available to our patrons. And so we would love to have you join in. I'm excited about the fact that we have lots of different kinds of artist styles involved in the creation of this because all of these, uh, all these experiences, uh, disability and, and mental illness and, and neurodivergence are, are very different and, and they're not isolated to a particular demographic of people uh, or anything like that. And, and so I wanted the art in the book to represent that diversity. And uh, so we're, we're seeing that in the artwork and I'm really excited about that and would love to have more styles of art uh, as part of, of our, our book. So please artists, uh, if you're interested in that and you identify as one of those, please contact me. And already, uh, if you're interested in the book, you can get a preview of that. If you hop over to the DMs Guild and the link is in the show notes, you can see we already have a preview table edition, so you can start creating those characters right now. Now, we don't have all the descriptions ready yet. Those will be in the full book, but the preview table edition has all of the tables so that you can roll up those characters as you need. And so now the last thing that I want to get to is our Patreon. We have different uh, patron levels, as those of you who are familiar with Patreon are familiar with. Right? What we're doing as Wormworks Publishing is more than just making books. All right? We really, truly want to provide the resources, the training, everything that you need to make other people's lives better, to set out on that adventure and change the world. And so uh, what we do is, is for our, our Wormlings, uh, level of patrons, you get not only this book that we are working on right now for free, but you get access to everything that we publish for free. Now, little tip, if you haven't figured this one out, you can actually save yourself a lot of money by signing up for Wormling status when the book comes out, download all of our other content that's currently available, 
and maybe check in once a year, sign up, and then cancel your membership. Now, we hope you won't do that because we hope that by signing up that you really believe in what we're trying to do and that you want to be a part of it, that we're starting a movement of change in the world using Dungeons and & Dragons and other tabletop role-playing games to make that happen. And so we would love your support to see that. Now, if you sign up for the Young Dragon level of patronage, you actually get access not only to that book, uh, the Disabilities and Depths book that I'm working on, but also everything that we make, right? We are, are the NPCs of the Disabled NPC of the Week, the Accessible Adventure of the Week that we're going to produce that will have a, some kind of uh, disabled characters or uh, accessibility information or something like that worked into the adventure. Uh, and so we can see more of that and hopefully that people will see that and say, this is a good idea. I want to do this in my adventures too. So again, we're trying to start a movement here. And uh, if you are at the Young Dragon level, you can you not only get all of that for free because those actually will be free, but you'll be able to see it as it's being written. And if you have thoughts on it, you can jump on our Discord server and say, hey, I'd like to uh, see this in there, or, or I'd like to see this change or, or whatever, or, or what about this idea? And you can share that with us on our Discord. And, and speaking of, our Discord server is open to all of our patrons. And it is a safe place to talk about Dungeons and Dragons or other tabletop role-playing games, uh, to talk about advocacy and finding other disabled, mentally ill, and neurodivergent players and dungeon masters and non-disabled allies. Right? It's a no ableism zone. It's a safe place to come and hang out and, and just care about each other. And so uh, I hope that, that you'll see that as, as a real value in what we're offering. Now, if you're not sure about that or just money's tight for you or, or whatever it is, uh, you can go to warmworkspublishing.com, our website, and sign up for our free newsletter. All right? Just with that, it's completely free. The, our uh, letters will come out about once a week. And just for signing up, you get our Nullamancer subclass. That was for free. And you'll also get book release announcements, notifications of our new products, our disabled NPC of the week, our accessible adventure of the week, tips on how to use role-playing games to make people's lives better. And just the more support that we have, the more even if, if you can't support us financially, if you can support us by, uh, you know, by retweeting, by uh, subscribing to, uh, to this channel right here, just right now, that little bell uh, down there. If you're on YouTube, you can click on that, subscribing to our, um, our podcast or wherever it is that you're catching this show. Uh, get that subscription and share it to spread the word. We, that, is, that is just as important to us. And, and to what we're trying to accomplish as your financial support. And so however you're able to do that, we really appreciate it. And so now with all of that, thanks for hanging around. And now let's jump into our interview. Wormworks Publishing is dedicated to helping you make lives better through tabletop role-playing games. And so we're thrilled that our first guest is a kindred spirit in our cause, Adam Davis from Game to Grow. So Adam, welcome. And tell us about Game to Grow. How does it work? Thanks for having me. So Game to Grow, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, we're based in the greater Seattle area, but we actually have uh, participants worldwide. Um, but our, our mission is the use of games of all kinds for therapeutic, educational, and community growth. Uh, we're, what we're most well known for is our therapeutic use of tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons and Dragons, but not exclusively. And then our training program where we actually train therapists, educators, and community members around the world to bring that life-enriching magic of games to their own communities. All right, cool. So, how have um, how long have you been? Uh, has this been going? Uh, Game to Grow was founded in 2017, so we've been around for a handful of years at this point. Uh, I've actually been doing this work using tabletop role playing games to improve lives for over a decade now. Actually, uh, 2011 was when I first got started, uh, something like February of 2011, and then uh, the other founder of Game to Grow and I actually before. Game to Grow, myself and Adam Johns founded a small for-profit company for a few years called Wheelhouse Workshop. Um, so we 
started, uh, uh, like I said, 10 years ago, more or less. And then we ran a small two person company while we both had side jobs. So he's a, he was a full-time therapist in private practice. And I was a full-time classroom teacher teaching fourth grade literacy. While after our full-time jobs, we would spend our evenings running tabletop role-playing games for, for, I say kids, but I really mean, you know, as young as eight and as uh, up to emerging adulthood, we were helping them in a, in a, a social skills group, and I'm air quoting that because social skills is really not what we were doing. What we were looking at was helping these kids build that sort of social confidence um, to be able to connect with each other and build that capacity to connect so that they can form relationships, not just in our program, but also out there in the real world. And over the time of running both the pre wheelhouse workshop groups and then the wheelhouse workshop groups, we realized we could do so much more with this model if we had a bigger platform and uh, the capacity to, to spend more time and hire people. Um, so then we launched Game to Grow, like I said, in 2017. And we have done several rounds of hiring now. We have new directors and new uh, facilitators that are uh, all over the country now. So we have, uh, we started off, when we first started Wheelhouse Workshop, we had three clients a week. Uh, that Adam Johns and I ran groups for, and then now we have somewhere between 120 and 150 participants a week that come to our tabletop role-playing game groups or our Minecraft groups. So we're continuing to serve a larger audience across the world now. Wow, that's great. <laughs> so, um, so how have you seen lives change through this? So. Um, it would help to understand a little bit more about the demographic we're working with. So we don't actually require any sort of diagnosis to attend our groups. We're, we're basically helping young people um, who may be struggling for one reason or another, connect with other people, connect with their peers, and really have that sense of rewarding, enriching social experience that they may have lacked. So a lot of our participants do have diagnoses of autism or ADHD or anxiety or depression. And a, a kind of constant across that is they haven't really had an opportunity for one reason or another to have a meaningful social connection. So that means they've never really been to a birthday party, never really had a birthday party that people have attended. Maybe they've never wanted to. Um, and a lot of our participants have been in that kind of direct instruction, social skills training program. And I'm air quoting again here because this is something that I want to, I'm wanting to, to clearly define as something different than what our program is. So a lot of our youth were identified as needing some social support. And what that looked like was scripts that looked like sitting in compliance to do the thing that the teacher wanted them to do, which was ask the right questions, make eye contact, have, you know, good first impressions, because the goal there is to help them function socially. But we don't want our participants to just function socially to fit in or to camouflage. We want them to flourish socially on their own terms, respecting their own autonomy and, and making sure they're connecting socially in the ways that they want to connect and as much as they want to connect. So the real sign of that success is not, I'm not checking boxes to say, oh, this person met the expectations of a social skills training program and sustained eye contact for this long or those kinds of, of outcomes. What we look at really is de de decreasing that sense of social distress and really looking at are participants desiring more social contact? Because that is a sign that they're not only, you know, getting along with other people, but seeking it out and requesting it and being excited about that. We, we, we believe that we are social animals and that we our lives are more enriched when we can have access to this social dynamic, the social sphere. So what we look at and a lot of this, the, the kind of exciting things we see, and we hear this from parents and from the participants themselves is that, you know, the, the participants now actually look forward to leaving the house. They're excited about going to spend time with peers. One parent even said that it was like eating their vegetables without knowing they were eating their vegetables because <laughs> it's a fun and dynamic social space that has its own sort of built-in rewards. So we don't have to provide any sort of extrinsic motivators. We don't, we're not giving, you know, progress charts or, or candy or anything like that to say, great, you did a good job doing some social behaviors. We can actually build a safe and rewarding social space where then the participants can build that capacity to connect. They'll, they'll work on through the context of a, of a tabletop role-playing game, their ability to self-regulate, their ability to collaborate and communicate effectively with other people, logical uh, inductive and deductive reasoning. They'll build that capacity for symbolic thinking. There's so many things that are sort of naturally built into a tabletop role-playing game that we are cultivating 
through harnessing the power that's already built into the game, but really looking at translating those, you know, those capacities into other contexts so that there is an intrinsic motivation to be social. So to answer your your question, <laughs> what, what kinds of life enriching life enriching magic we've actually seen is we have had participants I mentioned earlier who had never been to a birthday party before, but now they're inviting their team of adventurers to come over to their house on a weekend. And that right there is a huge sign of, of success. I had a group, this was before COVID hit, where we were taking a break for the summer. And at the end of the, you know, the, the spring quarter, we were wrapping up and some of them were going to be returning in the fall, but most of them were taking a break for the summer. And the, these teenage boys, you know, 13 to 15 year old boys um, stood up from the table and they were, you know, the parents were outside. They were going to go get picked up and go home, but they paused for a moment kind of looked at each other. They weren't quite ready to leave. And one of them said, I'm going to miss you guys. Hmm. Um, and then they looked at each other and the other one said, yeah, I'm going to miss you too. And then they hugged. And that might seem like a, you know, a trivial thing. Um, but that wasn't in any way prompted by an adult or a facilitator to say, here's what it looks like to show you care for somebody. Um, that was them organically connecting with each other in a way that was mutually supportive of their relationship. Um, and that is the kind of success that we look for is that um, social reciprocity. Wow. That's, I mean, having worked with, uh, with those that have those kind of social struggles. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. That's uh, that, that right there, you know, that that's real life experience points, real life <laughs> leveling up, adding adding features, yeah, <laughs> right. And it's actually really hard, even for adults who have been interacting socially in mostly positive ways for our whole lives. It's still hard for us to find somebody that we we get along with and say, "Hey, I'd like to see you again. Let's exchange contact information." It's hard, and so you know, recognizing that it's challenging for. Uh, you know, across the lifespan and across the, the range of human experiences, it's difficult to do that. So really seeing young people who have some additional kinds of struggles or setbacks pushing through to do that is really a, a beautiful sign that that's how valuable those relationships are. Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay, so then is the magic in the game itself or is it in your method <laughs> or something else? There's uh, that's a great question. And the, the, the best way that I like to think about it is the game is just the vessel. Um, the magic is in the play. Because I've, I've, you know, played tabletop role playing games f for a very long time, for a very, very long time. And uh, I have played games that were super fun and super exciting. And I have played games that were just a grueling slog of procedural dice rolling. Um, and so there's there's really a lot to be said for it. the game can can disappear. And in fact, the most um, beneficial sessions of tabletop role playing games oftentimes only vaguely remember re uh, resemble to, you know the game itself at times because what's really the magic there is is the story is the play. And oftentimes, you know, the the definition of play. Stuart Brown in his book Play talks about the the sort of descriptive qualities of play. And oftentimes it involves losing track of the rules and losing track of yourself and losing track of time and really having that reduction of your performance anxiety and that the, the, you're, you're actually in the present moment connecting with other people. So it's a flow state. And that is really what we're aiming for when we're utilizing these games is ideally the game is just a gateway into this unstructured narrative social play that almost looks like the playground. It's it's like that kind of playground experience where you're chasing each other around. I mean, I grew up playing Power Rangers or Ninja Turtles on the playground, and you know, you just you'd roll switch, you'd change, you'd, you'd dynamically respond to how the situation happens, all sort of in the present moment. And that kind of um, social navigation is really what we want in the game. But sometimes the game gets in the way, so we have to kind of ignore parts of the game and highlight other parts of the game to provide it that structure, that safety net. But really. It's the play. The play is the thing. Hmm. Yeah, you know they uh, they talk a lot about uh, how you know with with kids that kids learn through play and the importance of recess and all that kind of stuff. And um, but you know that's um, not just with uh, with you know preschoolers and toddlers and that um, 
and, and I found it's uh, it's true of adults too. Um, and so it, absolutely, you know, yeah. Unfortunately, we lose that uh, along the way uh, to some but, degree because we lose our but, creativity and stuff. But we don't. This is the this is the. I'm going to push back on this a little bit because I don't think we do naturally. We do because of certain societal uh, influences that say that adults shouldn't play that say these things, but adults still do play. Adults who, you know, it, it play, play is not necessarily an activity. Also, I wanna just broaden our perspective on this too. Play is not necessarily just the activity. Play is the, the disposition that you take. Play is the relationship you have. There's an, another book, uh, Ian Bogos wrote a book called Play Anything. And he, he uses an example of his daughter when they're walking through the mall is like skipping over the stones in the mall and the mall floor and how she's playing she's engaging with the with the stones in the floor and that that is accessible to anybody it's just about a relationship and a dynamic relationship with your environment it's almost like a a scientific i want to experiment and tinker and adults mm -hmm. do this all the time anybody with a, a hobby um tinkers and they they play with things and anytime you know i like to cook and when i'm cooking i'm i'm engaging in play because i'm trying new things i'm losing track of of you know the success criteria at times to try to see what happens. And that's the access to that, I think is something that I think is crucial. And we, it, it is tempting to think that play is for children or that play is not cool, but the opposite of work is, sorry, the opposite of play is not work. The opposite of play is depression. Um, and this is, that's a quote from Stuart Brown's book as well. And that's the important thing that we want to remind everybody, not just youth and not just youth in need of additional social supports, but everyone can really benefit from engaging in this authentic relational play experience. And I'm sure you know this as someone who's, you know, speaking from the hilltops about the benefits of playing games in a safe and supportive and inclusive way. Like we, we, This will make the world a better place if we were able to relate to each other in a more authentic way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um... No, I, uh, my my thought was it's the um, we we get these we're told no you can't play that way and um, and and so you know we lose we lose some creativity. I know when I play with my kids and you know and they're like okay here's my dinosaurs you know let's play and um, and and I can't just sit down the way I used to and just immediately mentally jump into that world. And, um, and I go, oh wow, I really lost something here, you know. And uh, so, so I, I need, and I th this seems to be a part of of what we're talking about is is I need some kind of a system to, um, you know, uh, oh, give me give me a, a to hit, you know, roll <laughs> or something like that, you know. And then it's okay now I could jump in, but I need. Like I, I need an ordered system. Whereas with them, it's um, I made a comment a number of years ago. I was working with some preschool kids, and um, and we're sitting around. And we're playing Duck Duck Goose, right? And if you ever played Duck Duck Goose with uh, with kids with preschool kids, I described it as it's like a dream that the rules change every thirty seconds, <laughs> and everyone just goes with it and assumes that it's just normal. And and so you have oh they'll run around three times instead of just once or you know whatever or you know it's it's the rules are constantly changing and, and everyone just goes with it and and it's like it's okay because this is we're just having fun and what it comes down to is the fun is the main thing and yes. it's like oh well you guys get it <laughs> like, we need to, we need to learn that so, yes yeah. I think that is a beautiful story yes the, oftentimes the 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 kids definitely get it and it's uh, sometimes it's adults you're mentioning we don't play the right way there is there is something to be said for adults trying to help kids play by encouraging them to play in the, the right way um and sometimes that is you know you mentioned having you know you're the you, i don't know if you mentioned it was your children but uh, with dinosaurs right mm -hmm. and if the kids want to say these dinosaurs are going on a date and these dinosaurs are driving in a car. And, you know, the adult might say, well, actually, <laughs> dinosaurs didn't have cars. Dinosaurs actually didn't speak. So dinosaurs are, that's a carnivore. They're probably fighting, right? And so then you're, you know, not you in this case, but, you know, the adult in that case is trying to help by enforcing sort of script, you know, and like a, a little kid playing with a G.I. Joe, 
maybe he wants that GI Joe to go, you know, be a barista and have a little play at the because they, you know, doing some some imitative social play with something that they they saw with the parent. But if the parent says, no, 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 GI Joe is uh, not a barista. GI Joe is a soldier. He's a real American hero. So this is how you play with GI Joe, right? Then we're preventing that that sort of uh, broad view of what we can do with our unstructured play. And so there's 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 lots of theories about this. We have some play therapists on our staff, and I'm not trained as a play therapist, but about the benefits of having blocks instead of G.I. Joe, because the blocks can be a person. The blocks can be literally building blocks. It could be a car. It could be a plane. It could be a whole lot of things. So there's something really nice about tabletop role-playing games because they are the blocks and not the G.I. Joes in so many ways because we can do so much with it. We've got a, a basic back and forth structure where the game master describes things and the players can kind of say or do whatever they want to do. And then we see what happens. And sometimes it's built into the rules and it's about the abilities they want to try to do based on the rules as written. And sometimes it's, uh, I want to try to jump over that thing. All right, let's, let's see what happens. Um, I want to use this spell in a way you never considered it. Okay, let's, Let's see what happens. Now we're engaging in play when everybody leans forward and gets excited about the potential in that moment, um, especially when you can bend or break the rules to cultivate that sense of, of leaning in, that, that enthusiasm. That's where the magic is. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you already mentioned that um, this is a, a global thing uh, that you guys are doing. Uh, so how can uh, people that are not connected with you benefit from your work? So uh, if... People want to join a group. We actually have groups for, uh, for youth as young as eight, I believe is our, our youngest slot right there. And then we have adult groups. So people who want to participate can participate from anywhere in the world. You can just go to gametogrow.org and see uh, the sign up links there. We have, a f our groups are full right now, but we have waiting lists. You can join our waiting list. We're actually in the middle of hiring right now. Um, and we actually, we transitioned our groups uh, digital uh, March of 2020 as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And before that, all of our groups were in Seattle or uh, the surrounding areas. And we had, you know, 30 something youth a week um, because we were bound by geographic location. And then after we went virtual, it was an interesting thing because I was really struggling. We, we, like many organizations, shifted our groups virtual as a triage. Um, oh my gosh, what are we doing? This is a scary time. Um, and then what happened as a response to that is our groups were no longer bound by geography in several different ways. Um, so we were then, we had, we, had, we had people joining our waiting list from other places around the country for years, hoping someday we'd open up a small branch in their neighborhood in Pennsylvania or, or wherever. And suddenly we could actually put them in a group. So all of these people who had been waiting for sometimes years to maybe get into a group were now able to join a group in an, with another youth in another part of the world, which is really interesting. So we also had um, people in Australia who were hoping someday we would open up a branch in Australia able to join. And we have Western Europe and parts of Asia all have participants playing together. And when I was a kid, we had pen pals in school. Mm -hmm. And it was such a neat experience to you know, share your thoughts and feelings with someone in a different part of the country or the world. And now these youth don't just get the opportunity to share their thoughts and feelings. They join forces and save the world. <laughs> They're joining a team of adventuring heroes um, with people from all over the world. So it's really like a, a really cool opportunity for some for some bridge building across, uh, across the world. So that, that's one way people can participate with us. If they want to join our groups, we have, we're hiring right now to expand the capacity to do so. We also have trainings that I mentioned this earlier as well, we have three different tiers or tracks of training program where we have mental health practitioners who can come and take, there's there's three sets of, of uh, six hour trainings people can participate in to become fully um, aware of, of what goes into the Game to Grow method. We also have trainings for educators, for the educational application of tabletop role playing games. And then we have a community track for maybe it's a parent, maybe it's someone who runs or works at a game store who's working in a community context. It's not looking at educational outcomes, or therapeutic outcomes, but really does still want to build a safe and supportive community around their tabletop role-playing game. They can learn all about those at gametogrow.org slash training. Okay. All right. Wow. Uh, what a, so, okay. A question with that, um, with people uh, not being able to connect in person, right? And we've been, since COVID, we've been playing virtually too, all right? How are you seeing the social development 
um, and and things, all of those kind of goals that, that you're working toward. With on the one hand, you have these great opportunities to connect with people that you know live outside your community. On the other hand, they're outside your community, and you can't you know sit down and around a table. And and so, can you just what are your what's your experience with that? So I'll be honest with you and say that I was worried when we went virtual, it was a, it was a triage and it was a lot of, um, we didn't apologize for what we were expecting was going to be a downgrade in our groups, but I was worried about it. Um, my, my training is in drama therapy. Um, I am very active. I'm very, uh, kinest kinesthetic. I like, I like to embody my characters and I want my players to also feel their characters in their bodies as well in a relational space in, in 3d in the room together. Um, so I was worried that we were going to see a reduction in the, in the impact of our work. And I was absolutely wrong about that. And um, we had so many parents reach out to us to say, it is so essential that they're having regular social contact right now. Um, that this is so extra important in the, in the, era of COVID. Um, but then what was also unique about this, as I mentioned that, that we were no longer bound by geography, we're also no longer bound by transportation. So as far as uh, access we have to actually help people, what are the, one of the big aspects of our work is that we want to build a cohort of individuals who can support each other. It's a peer learning model on top of a mentorship model. So when we have a group we put together, you know, before we, we had all the kids in Tacoma, Washington to choose from to build those cohorts together. But now we can build cohorts across the country and around the world, sometimes bound by time zones. Obviously, you know, someone in Australia is not going to have the same after school schedule as someone in New Hampshire. But w when we can build these groups together, we can then we no longer have to. to worry about that. So that's been really valuable as well to build those cohorts. But also parents don't have to drive their children to groups anymore, which means we're able to access people who maybe don't have that parental support or don't have the capacity financially or otherwise to drive a youth to an after school program and then wait for them and pick them up again, et cetera. So we're, we're able to access other things. And the other um, really beautiful thing about technology and the way that we're using it and in Game of Grows groups right now is that it's providing a valuable accessibility tool. So we have participants who who have some sometimes some non-communicative verbal sounds that they make um, in a in-person group. This sometimes might cause another person to be frustrated with them or to to cause some distress in other participants. But because we're in a virtual space now, those players with non-communicative sounds they can mute themselves, and hmm. that means that they can selectively be heard and they can have all of the sounds they want to make on their own. And it does not impair their ability to form those relationships. So which is a really, um, it's a fantastic opportunity to see someone leveraging and, and utilizing the, the accessibility tool that we have in our computers and then able to accomplish more building those relationships than they were when we were in person. Um, this, we've also had, um, you know, there, there are built-in things like, you know, we have some participants who become nonverbal at times. Um, some there, you know, it depends on the day, depends on the week, um, but because there's a, chat function in our zoom windows um they can type in what they what they want their characters to do or their thoughts or their feelings in a way that is allows them to still have that human connection it's mediated but it's still a very valuable human connection and there was a one of our facilitators was telling me a story recently about uh, one of her players was having a day where he was not able to communicate verbally um due, due to some some medical complications but that day that player called their father in to join in the session where the father was there and the the player had a, an assistive device where they could type what their words what they what what they wanted to say and then the father read it hmm. so then the father is able to be the voice for their child for the rest of the participants and the other participants in the group saw and recognized and appreciated and validated this experience which helped this person who might have otherwise stayed home and not been able to to connect with other people allowed them to connect meaningfully and the other players to see them, recognize them, validate them and celebrate their participation. And that kind of thing is only possible because of the fact that we were able to, to join them in their home instead of having to have them drive. And then the parent is you know, running errands during the group or whatever the case may be. So there's, there is a lot of magic in leveraging 
the technology instead of seeing it as an obstacle, which I, I guarantee you, I was really worried. Like I said, I was worried about the technological mediation. But once we push through and realize that what we have here is a valuable tool set, not just something that inhibits our ability to connect with each other, that um, I think has been a really eye-opening experience, which is part of the reason why we've kept pushing for more online programming. We will at some point go back to having some of our groups be in person as well, but I think we're always going to be having a lot of, of virtual groups now just because of the power that they, they enable us to have to connect with people around the world. Hmm. Wow, that's great. Okay, so you just rescued a gin from the hands of any freak. <laughs> and it offers you three wishes to achieve Game to Grow's goals. What do you wish for? Um, <laughs> this is a great question. Um, I have to, so one of the things that's made us successful as an organization is being able to respond to the emerging needs. So I'm going to tell you this. I'm only going to use one wish for now. I'm going to bank the other ones <laughs> um, to see how things go. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I could say I wish for donations. I wish for grant funding. Um, because I think that would that would help us with so much of our mission. But I, I'm going to switch that around and I'm going to say, um, if I could have one wish, I wish more people knew about our mission. Um, because I, I think that if more people knew about the work that Game to Grow was doing, I think that um, even if they're not joining our groups, even if they're not receiving our training or even donating to us, I think if more people were aware about that life enriching magic of games, I think the world would be a better place. Um, and I think if more people knew about our mission, certainly, they would donate to us. They would help us write grants. They would, you know, do streaming to support Game to Grow and things like that. But I don't want to wish for those because I think those are small potatoes. I want to wish for a world in which everyone knew about the life enriching magic of games and authentic relational social play and or were eager to pursue it. All right. So everyone, there's a <laughs> share button right there as you're watching. You guys can be genies and uh, and help to make that wish come true. So that's awesome. All right, so what one message would you like to give people that are struggling with mental illness? One message I would give to people who are struggling with mental illness. Um, I think the, I, for, I, first of all, I would say I'm not in a position to give advice. Um, I would say that, um, the because every, everyone's journey is different and everyone's journey is unique um but i would say it's okay to not be okay i'm stealing that line from take this another great nonprofit. um but i think it, the, the important thing that you, when when someone is struggling is recognizing that struggling is actually pretty normal um struggling is actually where most of us are and there's people who are struggling and people who don't know they're struggling um, and I think that if someone is struggling, then I think it's, it's first step is acknowledging that that's okay. It's normal to be struggling and then to do, take whatever steps you can to, to get some support and get some help. And I see a therapist, I am a huge advocate for normalizing, getting support and getting help from therapists who are qualified and trained. And, you know, that, that's, it's a, a certainly a really valuable thing, but, uh, it's, it's, um, yeah, that, that that is my my advice is is uh, to to take that moment and go. You know what? I'm not alone in struggling, and that it's okay for me to get the support that I need um, to push through and and maybe overcome and maybe live with that struggle. I think you might have answered my next question. <laughs> What's one message you want to give to people that are not struggling with mental illness? <laughs> get some support. <laughs> take a moment and see. Recognize that nobody nobody is is. Uh, is all the way uh, um, out of the out of the woods, and I think that's just it, that's okay. And I think that there's a um, a really dangerous belief that we're the only one who's struggling, or we're the only one who's lonely, or we're the only one who's isolated. And I think social media makes it a lot harder because you're looking at a lot of avatars and a lot of presentations, curated presentations of what people's lives might kind of look like. So I think it's the, the first thing I would, I would say is that nobody's life is, is looks like their curated persona and that most of us are struggling um, to have the kind of meaningful relationships that we want to have. Um, so it's okay to acknowledge that and it's okay to reach out and, and continue to cultivate those relationships that are meaningful and enriching. Um, Cause I, 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 one of the, 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 foundations of our model at game to grow. And one of the, the principles that we, adhere to is the value of relationships. 
the work that we do, all, all of the entire intervention that we've built our framework on is relational. And that authentic relational social play is something that isn't just for people who are struggling. It is not just for people who are really suffering. It is for people who are functioning. We, our goal is to bring everyone up to this position of social flourishing where we're connecting with each other in this authentic, you know, meaningful way where we can be, see and be seen in a community of, of mutual support and care. That's great. Um, all right, so uh, what projects are you working on right now besides uh, the whole COVID remote stuff? So Gain to Grow is has a, a lot of irons in the fire right now, um, and it will depend on funding. So as much as I wished for everybody to know about us, I will also do a little tiny wish for extra funding for some of these things too. But we have, um, we just got a grant to run groups for foster care youth. So most of our programming has traditionally been a fee per service. Um, we have a sliding scale, we have scholarships, etc. But we have yet not yet had the ability as a nonprofit to really have entirely um, service oriented groups where we have people who are not able to, to to otherwise attend our groups, attend our groups. We have these, we got this grant um, to run foster care groups, which I'm really excited about. I'm hoping to expand that program with more uh, uh, financial ability to do so. We also have a pilot program right now, um, really once a week at most, uh, myself and Adam Johns are, are putting this together, the other founder of Game to Grow, uh, for hospital groups. So there's a lot of youth who are struggling with isolation and solitude in a, in a medical context where they're in a hospital. And we've run, I think, four or five, you know, one-shot RPG adventures. We're using Critical Core, which I could probably also mention um, on, on this podcast as well. Um, but the uh, we're, we're running these sort of one-shots and seeing just how that, like, 90 minutes of narrative social play helps, you know, blossom some kids who've struggled being in a hospital bed, unable to move and connect with people in the normal way, but we just have an iPad and some dice and connecting with some other kids and connecting with, you know, with our facilitators and really seeing how um, impactful that can be. We had a, a, a someone who was in the child life specialist say that they had not seen one of their kids who'd been in the hospital for a while, you know, smile in a week. But now they're helping the king, you know, make the food. Like I said earlier, which sometimes it barely resembles a uh, tabletop role-playing game. We're helping the king make the food for the very fancy dinner that they're having. Um, and that's, you know, the first time they smile in a week, right? So there's, there's, that's really something that I'm, I'm very passionate about personally, is about expanding that program as well. We've also been um, working on programming for veterans. Uh, so two members of our team, Dr. Dr. Jared Kilmer and Dr. Elizabeth Kilmer, both have experience using tabletop role-playing games with uh, the VA. And so we're going to take some of their knowledge, skills, and experience and, and pilot some program uh, through game to grow for to, to help veterans struggling with, with the, the, the myriad of things that veterans might be struggling with. So um, like I said, there's lots of irons in the fire um, as well. I um, mentioned very briefly, I'm wearing the Critical Core t-shirt. Um, we uh, launched Critical Core on Kickstarter in 2019, and it was uh, designed to be a beginner's box for a therapeutic tabletop role-playing games. So we basically have in there a simplified rule set. It's very similar to Dungeons & Dragons. It's actually built on the Open Gaming uh, SRD from 5th edition. So it's a simplified rule set, and then we also have in there a facilitator's guide where we use a lot of the the you know, battle tested, so to speak, um, participation structures we've built over a decade of practice. And then we also have adventure modules in there that are streamlined with a with a narrative structure that we've Im implemented to really guide facilitators and how to structure and look at building those, what we call the core capacities. So that's all, uh, we actually have a web store available now. People can buy the digital version, the physical kits are in production, so they'll be for sale soon, but there's all of that you can find at criticalcore.org as well. And that one we are, continuing to build that out. So we have uh, the, the actual modules themselves. We had three modules in the physical kit, but we have a bunch of digital stretch goals that we're, we're still working on right now. Um, some with, with uh, Shannon Germain and Jerry Holkins, who were sort of guest stars of our Kickstarter. Um, and then we're, we're building more of those. We're gonna have those for sale um, through the uh, criticalcore.org website as well. So there's a lot, there's so many irons and so many fires right now. Um, I'm glad that we have a, a nice, uh, a great team of, of professionals all collaborating together to work on all these projects. That's cool. All right, so uh, we'll have your contact information in the show notes, but where is the one best place if people wanna contact you, 
they want to start learn to learn more uh, about you, what you're doing, anything like that, what is the one place to go to that's better than anything else? The one place to go is gametoro.org slash newsletter and join our newsletter. We don't send things out much more than once a month, um, but that is where the first place we ever announce new things, like when, when Critical Core was launched, um, we announced it through our newsletter. We uh, Whenever we have new training opportunities, it's our newsletter, new group opportunities, it's our newsletter. That's the easiest place. We're also on social media and all of those as well, but the newsletter is, I say, the number one place to make sure you stay informed about the latest uh, what Game to Grow is up to. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Just, I, I, I just can't <laughs> say enough. I, I'm so excited. Uh, you know, the work that you're doing is, is, uh, it's, it's what I've been trying to do in my, just in my own space without all the, the training and things. So I'm actually really curious about the, the stuff that you guys have put out that I haven't had a chance to look at yet, uh, real in depth. And, um, and I just see the work you're doing, and, and like, yes, yes, this is it right here. This is it. <laughs> I mean, I can't wait to share this uh, with other people. And uh, so I hope that, that those of you who are watching, that, that you'll do that too, just to, to see uh, the power uh, of all of this. Um, you know, people say that, well, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, you're just saying that you're using magic, you're not really doing it. And, you know, I gotta push back on that because <laughs> the, I just, I see magic happening all the time. And, and so I just, I'm really excited about what you guys are doing and, uh, and just, just thank you for the work. And, and as a, uh, as a foster parent, um, I, uh, I also have to say, all right, that's, that's awesome. You guys are, are in the foster space too. Uh, Cause I know uh, firsthand what that's like. So. I that's appreciate cool. that. Well, th thanks for helping me, you know, spread the word about the life enriching magic of games. You're helping that genie, um, implement that wish. This next segment is called Playing the Other. This is all about playing a character that has particular symptoms or more specifically a particular disorder or neurodivergence or mental illness. And uh, so before I even start this, uh, I'm going to explain one that is close to me and is, is something that is part of my family. But what I also like to do is invite anyone else who is 18 and is willing to come on and on, onto the show and explain your experience and, and how you would like to see your experience uh, played out in Dungeons and Dragons or another tabletop role-playing game, uh, please send me a note. Uh, it's a family-friendly show, and and so you know if you can keep things PG and that, uh, we definitely appreciate that. But uh, but I, I'd love to have to hear directly from uh, those who have these experiences, and so that you can share that with people, so that they know how to uh, to express and demonstrate that to their players. So today's uh, today's condition is reactive attachment disorder. And so the way that reactive attachment disorder is experienced is, imagine a child's greatest fear. What do you think it is, right? In most cases, their biggest fear is abandonment. You know, as, as long as mom or dad or somebody's, you know, that parent, whoever that parent is, is there, then everything's gonna be okay. But if that changes, then everything falls apart. Well, in this case, what we're talking about is someone for whom that actually happens. And that could be because of neglect, uh, that the parent is maybe around, but not very much, and not when they're needed. It can happen because of, uh, sometimes because of abuse or neglect where the child is taken out of the home, ends up in the foster care system, uh, or, or as some other kind of, of living arrangement is abruptly changed, then they experience that. And then if, say, for example, you have a child who's moved through the foster care system from home to home until they find a permanent home for them, then that just amplifies the fear that here, I've, I know that the parents don't stick around and uh, I'm just going to get moved again. 
And so then the way that this plays out is then the child subconsciously, and oftentimes this will happen in the first year of their life before, you know, they have words to explain this, but the brain is forming an understanding of how the world works. And so they develop this subconscious attitude of, you're going to leave me anyway. So let's get it over with before I let my guard down and get too attached and hurt again. And so what happens is the child becomes distrustful of their caregiver and, and they, they actively push them away and, and they will act in ways that, that are essentially their, what they're trying to do with their behavior is to say, I'm going to do stuff so that you'll get rid of me because I know it's going to happen eventually. And so let's just get on with that already. And, um, and so they'll be very distrustful and, uh, and, and especially toward someone who reminds them of the person that they feel let them down the most. And so, for example, you have a child living with their mother and, um, and then their mother is, is taken from them. They never knew their dad. And, um, and, and so now they're distrustful of women, especially mother figures, right? And that could play out in when we talk about how you would play this in a game as a character and, and to be in a party with a character like this, that character is going to be distrustful of someone who reminds them of whoever that caregiver was that they lost, that they were most attached to. And uh, so it could be that, um, well, that my caregiver was a wizard. And so I don't trust wizards or it could be anything, or it could be uh, my caregiver was a minotaur. And now uh, I'm in this party where one of the people in the party is a minotaur or, you know, this is fantasy. It could be anything. And so if you're going to use a character with this, the dungeon master and the player should find a way to let the other players know what's going on. Now, this could be just write out layer cards on the table uh, right during session zero and say, you know, I'm playing this character, this is their situation, and so this is what you can expect. You know, or the party could encounter this character and uh, and see the situation that the character is in, or the character shares some uh, some backstory with them uh, at the at the inn or or something like that, and and they find out uh, about their background, and then when they see things happening, they start to realize uh, what's going on. But y- you want to make sure that the rest of the party knows as as soon as possible, and. That way you don't run into uh, problems where they're going, man, what is, what is your problem? And so the, you have, you have the, the hurting party and then you have the object of their distrust, uh, that, that uh, parental or caregiving figure uh, that has let them down. And so the hurting party then blames the object of distrust for everything, right? And they can be convinced otherwise each time. Say, no, no, it wasn't really this person's fault. Look, they, they had nothing to do with it. They weren't even there. That you know, They didn't say anything or, or whatever it is. But each time they have to be convinced, and it's not easy. And it won't be easy for them to believe that this object of distrust, this person, really cares about them. And they have to be convinced over and over and over again. Because there's always, even though, okay, well, maybe not this time, but there's always this fear that the object of distrust is going to leave. And so the the hurting party may, if that object of distrust is, is going somewhere, you know, even it's, I'm, I'm just going down to the general store to pick up some rope. Say, oh, I'll go with you. Or when are you going to be back? Are you coming back? Like, well, of course I'm coming back. I'm getting rope for our next adventure. But but they're going to keep asking those questions. Are, are you, know, you going to come back? And are you really going to come back? And, uh, and, you know, I might just need some kind of reinforcement. Well, you leave something with me so I can make sure 
that you're going to come back because you want to come back for that. And, and so that person, oftentimes that hurting party knows that that object of distrust cares, but just needs to be convinced repeatedly of that that relationship really is there and it's not going anywhere. It's, it's going to continue just because they have this unshakable feeling that something's going to go wrong. And just, it's, you know, logic isn't a part of this, right? This is feelings take over and, and I just can't shake that feeling that, so I just need that reinforcement or I'm going to be anxious the whole time you're gone, or I'm going to be anxious even when you're here. Cause I'm, I'm worried that something's going to happen. You're going to leave or, or even something's going to happen to you. And so over time, those two characters that have that, that, that distrust uh, in between can actually develop a really deep bond because there's been so much reinforcement, right? But that takes a long time. We're talking years, we're talking decades. And, and it never goes away completely. There's always that nagging uh, fear in the background of, of the hurting party's mind. And, and any kind of progress is going to be slow. It's, it's not, hey, I risk my neck to save you from the dragon. Of course, you know, sh- isn't that proof? It's not about that because that's thinking with the head, all right? And you got to talk to the heart. And so note, with all of these descriptions, like this example of reactive attachment disorder, no two people are alike. And so no two disability expressions are alike. What's described here is one expression, but no two expressions are identical, right? If you've experienced this or you have a family member or or someone you care about that has experienced this and you'd like to share your experience with that, right? You can send us a note or you can leave a comment here or or all the different ways that we have to communicate. You can come on our Discord if you're a patron and, and you can talk about it there. And also a reminder that If you're 18 years or older, have a disability, a mental illness, or neurodivergence, and you'd like to come on the show to help people understand what your life is like, what you experience, what challenges you face, and how you overcome them, and and talk about how you'd like to see what you experience represented in role-playing games, please contact me through the links in the show notes. Understand that the reason that we're doing this, the reason that we're incorporating these characters into the games is so lots of reasons number one representation just for people to ex- experience there's someone like me in the game here's someone like me th- that i encounter i'm not this oddity right but also to um so that other people that are not disabled that do not have the experiences that we're talking about can experience those things can On the one hand, to step in someone's shoes, sort of, it's not the same experience, but to get a sense of it and not more so than just putting on a blindfold and seeing what life is like for blind people, right, which doesn't really work, but but rather to to go, okay, well, how would I navigate if 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 that were me, how would I navigate the world? And and how would I deal with these different things? And, And to help to see that um that on the one hand there's challenges but there's also ways to overcome those challenges and so then uh but also so that people can have a chance to encounter these kinds of disabilities these kinds of symptoms so that when they encounter those people in real life it doesn't strike them as odd or 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 they're not afraid or or that is oh well i'm i'm used to that i'm i'm comfortable with that and and so we want people to be able to experience that um just to to make it easier for them to to recognize people that are different from them are not really so different so thank you for watching if you are still here then clearly you care about making people's lives better and we're so happy you are kindred spirits and so please consider us helping you to do that and by supporting our Patreon and, and all the links are in the show notes. And I'll close with this question. How has playing tabletop role-playing games made your life better?